morning. Welcome. We're glad to have you here on a very beautiful, beautiful day here on the uh, on the mountain. And uh, always great to have you. We got folks inside. We got folks outside, and uh, it's just a beautiful day in the neighborhood. All right. Well, my name is Teddy Baker, along with my wife Jan, Jim, and Sandra Pinter. This is our our weekly ministry. Jesus and Jeans worship at the cottage, and uh, we're just out of it. We're over five years, I think, now, and uh, going, going, just amazing. I was just talking with the gentleman outside, and just um, I, I'm always amazed at, at uh, what God has done through this ministry and uh, continues to do. And we thank y'all because y'all y'all are the uh, the reason that we do it, and and so thanks for being with us and coming and sharing. Got a, we're going to do some singing this morning, a couple of great uh, praise and worship contemporary songs that I got. So everybody ready to sing? Yeah. Got, your, got some caffeine and sugar and you're ready to go, all right? <laughs> Just as you are, you worship. Come, just as you are before your God. Come. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure. Just as you are worshiping, just as you are before your God. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure. Of a new song. I, I used to do this when uh, when we first started, and hadn't done it in a while, and uh, just felt that uh, it was appropriate for this Sunday. It's a, it's a real easy song to sing. I'll sing through it, and uh, you can get it. Uh, you can pick it up real quick. Oh 
of who he is before we get to our list. It just makes a difference in, in how we pray and how God hears and, and how God acts and, and moves in our lives. And uh, I, I love praise and worship songs that, that do that. They say, God, you and you alone are holy. We have uh, several things to pray about that uh, Jan is adding to as we speak. That's right. <laughs> we uh, want to lift up a friend of ours that uh, is. Uh, he and his wife have just a, a wonderful, wonderful business, and they they've just become part of our family in, in so many different ways. But uh, Chuck Eland. Uh, uh, they have a company called Pop the Court that does tours up in the in the wine country here, and uh, uh, they're just great. He's going, his wife, uh, Latanya, uh, and Chuck's going in for some tests this week, uh, some uh, bone marrow tests. Um, and so we just want to pray that uh, for Chuck and, and Latanya, and uh, just pray that those uh, those tests will uh, be positive, that uh, that his health is, uh, is strengthened and. Uh, um, and uh, God already knows what all that's going on. I can't put it into words. And we want to friend, uh, remember our friend Sherry Connor. Sherry was at worship with us last Sunday and uh, went home and was out walking the dog. And uh, uh, the dog saw her husband, Tommy Joe, coming in from a gig. And uh, the dog took off running and Sherry fell and broke her hand in three places. <laughs> and uh, looks, you know, had a, her face was just kind of, Street pizza, you know how that goes when you land on, on asphalt. Just, you know, just, you know, bruised up and banged up in, a, in her arm as well. And so uh, just keep Sherry in your prayers. Uh, we had a gentleman that we prayed for several weeks ago, a guy by the name of Ricky Allen, who is a local guy here in town. And uh, Ricky went in, uh, was just got sick, went into the hospital and found out he had some type of bacterial in fact infection that ended up costing him uh, his hands and, and his feet and they, they took off both hands and both feet to, to save his life and uh, and through our ministry we, we were able to uh, to donate to him and to help him uh, build a, a ramp uh, for a wheelchair and uh, just being able to navigate through his home much less uh, earn a living. I, I can't even imagine. And so uh, we we're just want to thank y'all again for your giving. You know, every dime that comes in here, we we give back to the community to 
help families and to help people who are in, in dire straits. Uh, they don't have to be homeless. They can have a, you know, a bacterial infection. And uh, that, that happens like that. And so just want to uh, keep Ricky Island in, in your prayers and uh, certainly his family. Um, our friend John Blinds, uh, we were able to visit with him a little bit and this past week, and he's continually on the mend and uh, uh, is able, uh, through his, his knee operation, to, uh, is getting. I think the guy's ready to go dancing, man. I, I mean, he's, uh, <laughs> he's amazing because Angela, that works here, we, she's had uh, had a had a real struggle with her her knee surgery, and, and John's just tripping the light fandango. So I, you know. I, Praise God for that and uh, and for he and Kathy and we, we love them and uh, we just pray for continued he healing there. And I want us to continue to pray. If you're not already doing it, please, you know, just remember our leaders, both nationally and uh, statewide. We, uh, we're, we're facing uh, difficult times here, more than difficult. We're, we're, very, we're, we're facing perilous times where we need godly leadership. We need godly counsel. And... Um, you know, I know some of the people that are uh, around our president. I, I, some of them I know personally. Some of the pastors that he surrounds him with, I, I know uh, through ministry. And so I, I know regardless of what you think about our president, I, I know that he's doing everything he can to surround himself with, with godly counsel and input. I know that for a fact because I know the people who are ministering to him. And so, uh, so we just want to continue to pray for their counsel and, and, and for their input and that he would have ears to hear and that he would ask for godly wisdom. I pray that for our governor. I pray that for our representatives. I pray that for anybody in leadership, whether you're in the medical field, whether you're in politics, wherever you are. Our, our first responders, we want to pray for Karen. Karen's already in Texas. She's in Corpus Christi, Texas. <laughs> right near ground zero. Thank God she's about 15 miles from the ocean, but she's one of our first responders that goes to these places. And, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. It's, it's not about just being aware, it's actually doing something about it. And, and I just, I love Karen's heart, that that's, that's her heart. And she's there right now, so we wanna pray for Karen uh, as she continues to, to work through our first responding, our first responders there. Let's pray together. Father, we, we do thank you, God, that you are a holy God. You, you are the God who provides. You are the God who redeems us, who saves us, who leads us and gives us wisdom. And Father, when we lack it, we know that we can come to you and ask for it, and you will give it to us. We pray, God, lifting up every single prayer request this morning and we we ask your involvement we ask you to go ahead and we know that you go before us that you would intervene in every situation and where there's healing we thank you lord we god i'm always too grateful when i get the praise reports today of how you're working is Rod and Kathy Gibson came in today. Rod was sharing me with, about their daughter Katie, that she's off the, the chemo, that she's off the radiation, that she has a break. And, and I just thank you, God, that you, you do those things. You intervene and you, you heal us. You inspire us. You, you encourage us. You keep us moving forward for the purpose that you've already set in place for our lives. And so, Father, I thank you today that you are the God we can turn to, that we can worship, that we can pour our hearts and we can come just as we are. And we can crawl up into your lap just like we would our own dad and say, Daddy, I, I need you. I need to talk with you. And I, I want to give you the praise that you deserve, the worship that you so richly deserve because of all that you are and all that you've done. We love you, Lord. We pray your blessings on our message today. Hide me behind the cross. Get me out of the way. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill this place. Change us from the inside out. Help us to be better prepared to engage the world around us, Lord. 
We give you praise in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen. 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 Well, the story is, uh, is told of a mother who once uh, approached the, the French Emperor Napoleon asking for a pardon for her son. And Napoleon replied that the young man had twice committed a certain crime and, and, and that for justice to be done, the man deserved to die. But the mother said, I don't ask for justice. She explained, I plead for mercy. But the son does not deserve mercy, replied Napoleon. And the mother said, it would not be mercy if he deserved it. <laughs> and mercy is all that I seek for him. And because of the mother's sound and, and clear reasoning, Napoleon said, well then, I will have mercy. And he spared the woman's son. You see, mercy is a gift to those who don't deserve it. A lot of times we will see this in a, in a legal setting. You'll often hear this used uh, in a court case after a person has been convicted and guilt has been assigned. When, when the sentence is about to be handed down, it is mercy that is sought, not innocence. <clears throat> At that point, your only hope is mercy. Mercy so that you don't get what you deserve. That's the way we are when we stand before the Father. I tell you all the time, what I deserve is to be in hell with a broke back where I couldn't even move around. That's what I deserve. <laughs> But that's not what I got. That's not what God gives us. And so this morning, we, we're going to continue on in our series on the Beatitudes. We're going we're to talk about this fifth Beatitude. Matthew 5, 7. That says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Now, as, as we've been doing this series... We're going to ask some questions. We're going to ask and we're going to answer some questions about mercy and what it, what it looks like in the life of someone who is actually merciful. And first, we want to ask, what is mercy? I always, I like to back into questions sometimes. I, I think it's helpful to understand what something is not in order to better understand what it is. Does that make sense? And so first, I, I want you to understand that mercy is not emotionalism. Mercy is not emotionalism. Just because a person sees a, a television commercial with starving kids or, you know, hungry animals and, and sheds some tears and wants to help, does not necessarily mean that that person is merciful. Often when a, a, a person is making decisions or, or doing something out of an emotional response, it's to uh, alleviate the emotions that they are, they are feeling rather than really acting out of a heart filled with mercy. Again, does that make sense? Because a lot of times we, we have this emotional response and we want to act and we want to do something. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing that out of a heart of mercy. It could just be your emotions that are overflowing inside you. Now, just to clarify something, those who are merciful, those who do have a heart of mercy will often experience deep emotions. But just because a person is emotional doesn't make them merciful. I want you to get that. Now, not only do we sometimes uh, mistake someone who is acting out of their emotions as merciful, but sometimes we also look at people who, uh, let's say, 
have given large amounts of money or aid to charities or, or people. We Often we call them humanitarians. And, and we believe, well, they've got to be just a real merciful person. But that's not really the case. Mercy is not humanitarianism. It's not, only, not emotionalism and it's not humanitarianism. A person can be a humanitarian and, and not be merciful. People sometimes do good things, not out of a heart of mercy, but really more for selfish reasons, such as maybe a, a, a real good tax write-off, or to look good in front of other people, or, or for their own sense of, of feeling good. But if humanitarian efforts are not coming from a heart of love, to benefit a, a person for the long run, th then it's really not mercy. And, and you really haven't done anything merciful, but rather you, you act out on, on selfish desires. Paul writes us, he tells us in 1 Corinthians 13.3, that's actually called the love chapter. You've heard me mention it before. Paul writes in, in 1 Corinthians 13.3, he says, if I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gained nothing. Paul says that even if a person gives away everything to the poor, but they didn't do it out of a genuine compassion and love, they have gained nothing. They have not acted mercifully. Now, just like the other point that we made about a emotionalism, while being a humanitarian doesn't make you merciful, a merciful person who has a heart of mercy will often be a humanitarian. They, they are aware of what's going on in the communities and in the world and in our nation. And they will genuinely care about other people. Okay, so if, if mercy is not emotionalism, even though emotions will often accompany acts of mercy, and mercy is not humanitarianism, but a merciful person will be often be a humanitarian, then what is mercy? I want to give you a couple of observations. The first one is this. Mercy is a heart attitude. Mercy is a heart attitude. Mercy is an attitude of the heart, of our heart, that comes from being in relationship with Christ. Mercy desires to, to help people by giving them what they do not necessarily deserve for their long-term benefit, not just a short-term pleasure. There, there is a difference between showing someone mercy and enabling bad choices and behavior. Do you get that? Big, big difference in in showing someone mercy. If you you want to, if, if you're going to offer mercy, you want it to be a long term deal. It's not just a short term fix or a short term pleasure, because that leads us into codependency. And, and so we we just try to appease people just to get them out of our way, just for the short term effort rather than really looking at them from a heart of mercy and say, what's going to benefit this person for the long-term run of their lives? And so mercy is a heart attitude that desires to truly help people for the long term. God is the perfect example of mercy. It's, it's because of His heart of love that He has shown us mercy and not making us pay for our own sins. That's why I tell you all the time, what I deserve, 
What I deserve is not what I got. What I deserve and the darkness in my life deserves to be in hell with a broke back. That's what I deserve. But God, out of His heart of love, has shown all of us mercy in not making us pay for our own sins. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5 says this, But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. But He did not pour out His mercy so that we could sin more, knowing that we don't have to pay the consequences. You see, that... That kind of mindset is called licentiousness. It's, it's refusing the, to obey the rules. It's saying, I can live the way I want to live and it's okay because God's already forgiven me in Christ Jesus. No. We often tarnish the image of God that we're created in just because of our actions and our deeds and our choices. But God is forgiving. God is forgiving. And again, when we just say, well, I'll just sin and, and then I'll just seek forgiveness. That is very questionable thinking for a believer in Jesus Christ. You see, we can't have it both ways. In the early church, there, there were some that, that were saying that this is what Paul was teaching that when, when Paul was talking about that, that we have been, because of God's great mercy, we have been forgiven. We have been shown mercy because He didn't make us pay for our sins. That God is a God of mercy and grace so we can keep sinning and be forgiven. And you can sort of live like you want. And Paul refutes this kind of thinking when he writes in Romans 6, 1 and 2. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means, he says. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? The Bible says it's like a dog that returns to his vomit. Have you ever seen a dog do that? You know? Kind of gross, isn't it? That's what the Bible says we're like. When we go back into that sinful deal, it's just like a dog returning to his vomit to consume what he just got rid of. And so God does not extend mercy so that we can do these same things over and over again. He extends mercy out of His love so that we can recover from our bad choices to make better choices by the power of His grace and the righteousness of His Son that's placed upon us. So for us to be merciful, we have to have a heart attitude. That attitude has to change, not in the muscle that beats in our chest, but in our inner being of who we are, from the spirit of who we are. That if we actually claim to have the Holy Spirit indwelling in us, it is His leadership, it is His guidance, it, it is His moving that should change us from the inside out. And so for us to be merciful, we have to have that heart attitude. Because it will help us in the long term. Not just to avoid the consequences in the short term. Does that make sense? So it helps us. God is working in our life for the long term. He's there for, for the rest of our lives, both here and in heaven. So not only is, is mercy a heart attitude, but also mercy is also a humble action. It is out of a heart attitude of mercy that we will perform actions, we'll become active in humility that are merciful. Our actions will come from a heart of humility 
and we will start actually doing something to help others. A merciful people, a, a merciful person it is not being merciful so that they will receive praise because of their actions. That's never what we're looking for. Not one person hardly, maybe the first person I think we ever helped, really knew where the, the money came from, the help came from. Because when we help organizations, I say, well, you know, usually we have your picture put in the paper. I go, no. <laughs> we don't want to be in your paper. We don't want any, we don't, we don't want any people know who we are. We just come in the name of Christ and we're doing something to help. I, I, don't, I don't want to take a bow for anything other than to bow my knee before Him. Amen. I, I don't want people to know because to me that, that stirs a greater curiosity to, to find out really what's going on. <laughs> and it may help that person come to know Christ. It doesn't help us, our ministry. I'm not trying to build something. We're already out of room now. <laughs> Glory. Glory. Hey, Lord. I, I want them to come to know Christ. I, I want them to, to know that there is an organization out there that reaches out and helps and doesn't ask for anything in return. And that's one claim that we can make. I can promise you, and I'll stand on that to the day I die. Amen. It's not for short-term benefit that God is working in our lives. It's for the long-term run. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 6, 2 through 4. He says this. So when you give to the needy, listen to these. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth. They have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. It's pretty clear, isn't it? So that your giving may be in secret. Then, then, very important word, then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. See, that's where the reward comes from. It comes from the Father. It does, doesn't come from the accolades of men. Mercy is a, a heart attitude that leads us to humble action. If you have your Bibles or if you're looking on, the, on your phone, I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, and we're going to be looking at verses 30 through 37. And we're going to look at an example of mercy in God's Word to help us see what it looks like in action. It's a very familiar story. It's the story of the Good Samaritan that Jesus talks about, that He tells. And so it says this in verse 30. In reply, Jesus says, so Jesus is answering a question. He's answering a situation that has come up. And so, Jesus often answered with these parables, with these stories. And He said, let those who have ears, let them hear. Let them hear what I'm saying. And so He says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. That's what the priest did. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him, paid his bill. bill. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. 
Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. And so Jesus asked the question, he says, which of these three do you think was a, a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law, one of the Pharisees, the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Pretty simple instruction, isn't it? Now, you see, the, the Samaritan man, and I want you to get this picture. The Samaritan man is the one who had mercy on the man who was, was beaten and left for dead. The, this man had a heart attitude of mercy that led him to humbly act mercifully toward this man. Now, this man who was beaten was probably a Jew. And the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. And this Samaritan extended mercy to this man even though he would have considered him an enemy. Someone who truly did not in his eyes deserve mercy. But who probably got what was coming to him. Now here's the application. You see... I believe many of us think we are merciful people. But if you really stop and assess that belief in light of, of God's Word, if you use God's Word as the plumb line, as the litmus test for being a merciful people, I, I think that many of us, myself included, I think that we would find that we are more about seeing what we believe to be justice carried out. I do it all the time. I look at that news screen and I see people that deserve what we just If it was up to me, and I don't tell you what I can do, I don't really do. There's probably more times I do that than I don't. And, and I have very, very strong beliefs about that. And not once have I said, Lord, have mercy. Have mercy on these people. Because they're, they're lost and they don't have you. And they don't see the world as you see it. They don't see the world as I should see it. Through the eyes of mercy. They don't. And I know God that you are strong enough and powerful enough. And wise enough to shut all this down in a heartbeat. That quick. But I don't know that there are enough of us that really bow the knee to plead for mercy instead of justice because I want justice. I want what I want when I want it. And that attitude leaves me empty. It leaves me with indigestion. It leaves me with heart palpitations. It leaves me my, with my carotid arteries just pounding at the neck. And in turn gives me a headache that I cannot just, oh God. It, it would have been so much easier to say, Lord, have mercy. Lord, hear my prayer. Have mercy on this situation. You see, if someone we, we did not like had, had some bad circumstance to happen to them, I, I think many of us would be 
more of an attitude of, well, he just, again, he just got what he deserved. He, you know, he made his bed, so sleep in it. How many times have we said that? Heard it all the time when I was growing up. So I was sort of status quo. I was a knucklehead. Because it's not easy to be merciful to those who are our enemies or those who we perceive to be our enemies. So if God wants us to be merciful and I am not at all that merciful, how do I become more merciful? How do I do that? Well, first, I, I believe it's easy for us to not be merciful because we're focused again on the wrong thing sometimes, just like what I just explained. It's not that, it's not that what we are focused on is bad. I think justice is right. I think justice is exactly what we need. That's, God set up those boundaries for us to live in. It's not that we're focused, what we're focused on is bad. It's just that it's not as important as pleading for mercy as other things could be. To become more merciful, it, it helps to keep our focus off less important matters. Because we want to major on the minors. The, the Pharisees, in, in Jesus' day, the Pharisees suffered this problem. See, this is not something that's just happened in America. The, this problem has been going on since the beginning of time. The Pharisees suffered this problem. They're, they had their focus on things that were not nearly as important as being merciful. Listen to what Jesus said to them in Matthew chapter 23. He says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a, a tenth of your spices, mint, mint, dill, and cumin. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. See, all of those were in the law. Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter. Justice, mercy, and faithfulness without neglecting the former. So you should do it all. Give, tithe, do all those things. But don't leave out the practice of justice, mercy, and faithfulness. And so it, it does not mean that we don't that we don't do the less important things we do. I, I think that we should give, and I, and I believe that, that tithing is a standard that's, that's established in the Bible, even a, a minimum. But when you start to focus on making sure that, well, I've got to give 10% to the penny of what I give, and I, and, and I, I think through whether, whether I should, I used to, deal with this till I went absolutely insane with families. Whether I try to calculate, should I give on the gross or should I give on the net? <laughs> so which one do I give on? Yes. <laughs> Whatever you decide, God doesn't care. He wants you to give out of a heart of giving. You know, what should I calculate? So, so, so what I... What do I do with the money that I receive for my birthday or for Christmas? And I had a gift card. Should I tithe on the gift card too? No! <laughs> Go have a great dinner. <laughs> Go buy something you need. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> so when we do this kind of stuff, we lose the proper focus on things that are more important. When you start doing that kind of stuff, <laughs> it becomes legalism. It becomes legalism in your heart. It becomes legalism in your life. And you start focusing on these little minute things. And for you that are OCD, I know it drives you crazy. <laughs> We, 
we lose the focus like, you know, man, how could I help somebody in need? You know, I got, I got a gift card for Christmas. Maybe I could take that gift card and give it to somebody who needs something. How cool would that be? Yeah. This is what the Lord said in Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. He says, I desire mercy not sacrifice. We need to keep our focus on the more important matters like mercy while not neglecting the less important things. Give, absolutely give, but give what you can afford to give. You know, if you can give 10%, give 10% of whatever you want to give 10% of. I don't care. If you got a dozen eggs, you know, how much is 10%? Is that like two? That's 1.2 eggs. So scramble them. <laughs> Bring them in. I'll eat it. But to become more merciful, we need to keep our focus on the mercy that we've received. I tell you again, when I look in the mirror and I see what God has done in my life from where I was to where I am, and not saying that I'm anywhere close to, to ever being perfect, not going to ever be that as long as I'm walking this sod, because wow, I'll find a way to shoot myself in the foot. But when I think about the mercy that I've received instead of what I deserve, it's a humbling experience. Jesus told this parable about the unmerciful servant in Matthew chapter 18. Listen to what he says. He says, a king wanted to settle accounts and one of his servants owed him an incredible amount of money that the servant couldn't pay. He asked the king to be patient and the king had mercy upon him and forgave him his debt. After he had been shown mercy, the servant went out and found a fellow servant who owed him a small amount of money, and the fellow servant asked the man for patience. But the man refused and had him thrown in jail until he could pay. Then the king found out about it. And in Matthew 18, it says this. He says, Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? You see, we need to realize at least those who have trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior that you've received an unbelievable amount of mercy already. You have been given mercy by being redeemed from an eternity in hell, which is what each one of us deserves. I would be leading the way if that's what we deserve. That's what we got. But when we keep the mercy that we've received already in front of our minds, we're going to be able to be more merciful toward our others toward our family members, our friends, the people we meet. So I want to ask you another practical question. Th does this mean that we can never collect a debt or seek justice for a wrong? Well, what if someone stole something from us? Does, does being merciful mean that, that we need to just let the thief keep what he took and, and not press charges? Does being merciful mean that justice is denied? No. Again, in Matthew chapter 23, what we read earlier of what Jesus said, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law. And what were those? Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. And Jesus said, You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Justice is something that should be practiced along with mercy and faithfulness. If you just want justice without practicing mercy and faithfulness, and they are not mutually exclusive, well, how can we act justly and be merciful? There, there's a great verse of Scripture in the Old Testament that, that gives you guidance 
uh, in this, and it's Micah 6, 8. If, if, you don't, if you've never written, read, read this, if you've never written it down, write it down, stick it on your refrigerator, put it wherever you can see it. And this is the formula. And this is what God said. He said, He has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. That's the formula. And I believe that acting justly and being merciful are going to flow from us who walk humbly with God. There's not going to be a list of rules when we personally administer justice or when we show mercy. We're, we're not going to have the checklist. Wow. Because we're going to be doing both. we close with this illustration. Years after the death of President Calvin Coolidge, this story came to light. It says, in the early days of his presidency, Coolidge awoke one morning in his hotel room to find a cat burglar going through his pockets. Coolidge spoke up asking the burglar not to take his watch chain because it contained an engraved charm he wanted to keep. Coolidge then engaged the thief in quiet conversation and discovered that he was a college student who had no money to pay his hotel bill or buy a ticket back to the campus. So Coolidge got out of bed and grabbed his wallet and he counted out $32, which he had also persuaded the dazed young man to give back. I'm going to give you this money, but you got to pay me back. And he declared it to be a loan. And he advised the young man to leave the way that he had come so as to avoid the secret service. And yes, the loan was paid back. He offered mercy to someone that didn't deserve it. So knowing when to do what is going to come when we walk humbly with the Lord. And as we love mercy and act mercifully, we can expect to be shown mercy by others and by God. You see, in the Sermon on the Mount, we notice that Jesus' subject was not on how people are to be saved, but on the fruit of those who allow the Holy Spirit to work in their lives. One of the signs or evidences that a person has been converted is that how he or she is now merciful, showing mercy in a way that brings glory to God, not to oneself, not to anyone else, is a mark of true Christianity. Nowhere, nowhere do we imitate God more than in showing the same mercy that, has, that He has shown us. God showed His mercy to us by giving His Son to die for us, by expressing His willingness to pardon and save us, and by sending His Spirit to renew and sanctify our hearts. Each day of our life, each hour, each moment that we partake of His mercy, the Bible says that the Lord's compassions never fail. Lamentations chapter 3. His mercies are new every single morning. If we then show mercy to the poor, the wretched, and the guilty, it shows that we are being changed into the image of Christ and that we have His Spirit in us. Christians who seek God will be given an abundance of opportunities to show His mercy. His mercy for this world is full of guilt. It's full of sorrow. It's full of poverty, of godlessness. So the question is, are you merciful? <laughs> maybe you're here today. Maybe you're in a trial. Maybe you're in a difficulty. Maybe you admit that it's natural for us, that your focus has been more on yourself. 
Maybe you've been praying, Lord, help me. Lord, have mercy on me. And it's, it's okay to ask God to show mercy on you and to help you. But maybe God has something even more for your life right now than just delivering you out of this trial. Maybe He's using this situation in your life to break your heart. To help you understand the needs of other people. To give you compassion and sympathy for others. Maybe God wants to do something more than just get you out of this circumstance. Maybe He wants to get... He, maybe He wants you to get something out of it. And what He wants you to get out of it is to have a Christ-like mercy built into your life so that, that you better have an understanding, have a better understanding that you will be able to see and not only see but feel compassion and not only see it and feel it but then do something about the needs around you. So that this verse really becomes true for all of us. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you again for your word and the power of it. And because we've said all through this series, it's like a a double-edged sword, it cuts straight to the marrow. It leaves nothing untouched. It leaves nothing unchanged. That is the work of the Holy Spirit that you've sent to, to give us, to establish us, to sanctify us, to guard our hearts. Father, help us to be a people of mercy. Help us to see things through your eyes and your heart. That we might be an instrument of peace in changing this world. You know what we live in. You know what's going on around us. And it is not Democrat. It is not Republican. It is not liberal. It is not conservative. It is the attack of the enemy who wants to destroy this world because we believe in you. Help us to be those instruments of peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. God bless y'all.